Hello everyone, XCT here. In this video we are going to solve Kaiju on Vulnab. This one is an ID chain which means it consists of multiple different vulnerable machines, it's rated hard and involves pivoting, filezilla, key pass, port bending and Active Directory certificate services. So let's go. As always we start with a port scan and you can see that there's RDP open on all of the machines and there's FTP and SSH. Usually on RDP you don't get anything if you don't have credentials. Um, SSH, well, you need credentials as well, right? FTP, well, sometimes this is anonymous, so we could try to connect there. All right, let's just try to use, as a user here, FTP and no password, and we can log in. So why does this work? Because, well, this is FileZilla and the FTP user just doesn't have a password configured, so you can enter whatever there, right? Okay. Um, and how do you find that FTP is a valid user? Well, you just have to try a few things and hope that some of them exist. You don't really know at this point. Um, but yeah, we found this FTP user, um, which wasn't too hard. And now we can look around a bit here, see if we can find anything. Okay, there's a, like a logs directory here, but nothing inside. Um, let's go to configs, um, filezilla, that's interesting. Um, there's a users.xml, let's get that one. Um, also, let's check licenses, it's empty, let's go to passwords. There's something here, so let's just get all of them. All right, there's software here. Um, that's interesting, it seems like they installed some software here um, in the location where this FTP is pointing as well. So let's see, um, maybe installers. There is FileZilla, KeePass, and Putty. Okay, so these seem to be installed. Let's go to KeePass. Um, all right, this looks like a fairly default installation folder, except there's database here. So let's check this one out. And there's a KeePass database here. So that's, that's pretty interesting as well, right? Let's uh, go to binary mode and then download it. All right, so that is, I think, everything we had here in the FTP. Let me check. Yeah, that, that's about it. It's okay. So now let's um, maybe read the text files first. Let's go for firewalls, FTP, which was the other, like, local. Okay, so these are this, these were from the passwords folder, right? So um, apparently there's a firewall user with this password. So they like to use something simple and depend one to three. Um, if you think that's too simple, well, that's exactly what people are doing in the real world as well. So I wouldn't say that. Um, FTP, FTP, well, that's kind of the user we used, although I think we don't have to put FTP as a password. If the user has FTP, we can just press enter, yes. So the user dis doesn't really have a password um, set. Again, let's cut these files. Um, we had these here, so just write them down. Um, and also this is interesting, right? This was from local.txt. So the administrator password was once in one of these txt files, but then they moved it to keepers. Interesting. We have a keepers database here that we found, right? But I can tell you right now that this database won't crack. So um, obviously it's a good idea to try it, but in this case it won't work. The only like other file we found is this users.xml. So let's have a look at that one. And this is actually a filezilla configuration file. Um, we should be seeing some users here. So this user here, FTP, is actually the one that we use to connect. So it's configured here and it's also telling us um, basically which local directory is exposed for this user if he connects, which is ePublic. All right. And then there's another user, um, Backup, which has this local directory ePrivate. So it would probably be good to get access to the Backup user, right? And another thing you notice here is the backup user has actually a password here. And this is the password hash of the user. And since this is missing on FTP, um, this basically means that FTP doesn't have a password set. Okay, but this is interesting. Maybe we can actually crack that. Let's um, copy it here, I guess. And then we kind of got to figure out what the hash format is that FileZilla is using. All right, so if you look for this hash format or just in general how FileZilla is doing this, you come across a couple of posts and one guy is asking here exactly how this is working. Let's see, um, I think that was one of the answers, which is basically giving it away. Um, the password is hashed using PBKDF2 with HMAC 
SHA-256. Okay, so that's the hash format, then base64 encoded without padding together with the random salt. Um, all right, so we have that here. We have um, a salt, a hash, and a number of iterations. So let's actually bring it into the um, correct format here. So we do, um, let's just call it backup.hash here. And then we have to put SHA-256, um, then the number of iterations. And then we put um, the salt, I believe. Let's get it here. And then the password hash, um, like this. Um, I think this looks pretty good. And then let's just do hashcat. Um, if you look for the hashcat examples, you'll find that 10,900 is the hash you actually got to use. So let's do that here. And then um, what we don't have yet is basically a word list. Um, so we can't really do that yet. Let's come up with a word list here. Um, well, we could put firewall, we could put Kaiju, we could put, um, I don't know, FTP. Did we see anything else? I think that's maybe IT, I don't know. Um, basically just build a simple word list here. Um, well, one thing we always want to put as well is username, right? Uh, user is called backup. So that's probably worth to put there as well. All right, um, now let's continue with the hashcat command here. Now we give it the word list. And then I also want to like use rules because a password might not just be one of the words, but some variation of it. So we are going to use one of the default word lists here from hashcat, which is best64. It's a fairly short one. And then let's just run it. So on my VM here, there's actually some issue with the OpenCL libraries, I believe. It doesn't really support the processor here, um, but it's not really a problem. I can crack it on my host and that's what I did. And you find the password like in a few seconds, so it's not really a problem. I'm not going to show the password here because, well, it's not needed and if you want it, well, do it on your own. But as soon as you get the password, you can basically connect to the machine via um, FTP, for example. Right, and that's the backups folder here, but it's empty. Um, and what you basically do if you find credentials is try them against everything, not just FTP. So we can, for example, try to use SSH to connect to the machine here, um, just like this. Oh, and I actually have to put the port. Yes. It's taking a second. Let's see. And this works. And we actually connect it here. Um, and as you can see, this is actually a local user. This is likely not the domain name, right? If you do host name, um, that's the host name. It also shows here, right? So this is a local user and we have no local user access to the machine. All right. Um, usually it's like a good idea to check out the desktop for any flags, but there's nothing here. Um, maybe let's just check out what's in C here. We like this. Um, okay, nothing too crazy here. Let's see if we do users, what other users exist. Well, Claire Frost is probably a domain user, right? Looks like a typical domain user scheme. And there's also some other account here, which is likely also a local account. And the administrator and the domain admin was once logged in here. All right, let's do some more enumeration here. Um, let's go to program files. Um, nothing too interesting here. Let's go to the other program files. Same really, not much here. Um, but we saw there's FileZilla, right? And we don't really see it here. And if you paid attention earlier, you probably saw that um, there's an E drive here as well. So it's not just C. And if we do get PS drive, um, obviously from PowerShell, we should get a nice list of what kind of drives are available on this machine. All right, and you, you can also see that there's an E drive. So let's go there. And there's the private and public folders. We already saw those. Um, there's also program files. Let's see. Um, okay, this seems to be the place where FileZilla is actually installed. So let's go there. All right, this is the installation directory um, of FileZilla and I didn't really change anything here when building this machine. And you see that there's an install lock here, which is created by default. And if we read it, which any user can do, we can see that FileZilla is actually storing the administrator hash inside this um, 
installation log. So any user, any low privileged user getting access to the machine can read the hash here and should it crack, get access to whatever privileges file server is running as. And this is exactly what we're going to do. I don't know why the hash is stored here in the log. I think it's bad and they should remove it, but yeah, I don't know. So let's copy this here and then we crack it. Um, it's exactly the same thing I did before. So I'm not going to do it here again. It's exactly the same command I showed earlier and I'm just running it on my host to get the password. And in fact, the same password list I used earlier is also going to work for this one. All right, let's think a bit here. Um, what is this admin really here? Um, this is admin inside FileZilla. This is not like the local admin on the machine or anything like that. It's just the admin in the application. But the application is running usually with a service user or a system. So if you can get admin inside the application, that's probably a good idea. So how do you use this admin password to do anything with FileZilla? Well, we are going to check the open ports here. And there's one that's related to FileZilla and it's this one. This is actually the administration port of FileZilla. And if you um, ever use it, there's like an admin UI where you can connect to a server and then do things like create users, um, change settings and so on. And the way this works is that you connect to this port, um, which is listening locally here. Um, since we have SSH access, we can forward this port to our machine and then connect there with the FileZilla UI. And this is exactly what we're going to do. So let's exit here for now. Then let's set up the port forward, which is just like this. And then we do it just like this. We're taking the port um, and forwarding it to our local machine. So now it should be listening here. If you do netstat and grab, you can see it's now listening on our machine. All right. So now we should be able to connect to this port and change settings on the FileZilla server. So now we are going to start the FileZilla UI and then talk to the server. One thing to, to keep in mind here is that you have to have the exact same version that's running on the machine, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, and on the machine, it's this version that's running. You can see that from the config files um, or the log also, I believe. And then you gotta find the exact same version and we should be able to connect. You just give it localhost, the port, and then the password, which we cracked in the last step. We connect here, all right, this worked. And now we can change the server configuration. All right, we can put a log file path here. There's some other options. Um, in the user's point here, you can actually um, change user passwords and which directories they expose and so on. I'm not going to click it because in this exact version, there's a bug on Linux. So it basically um, blows up if you try to change the path of a user. It's just going to show errors. So I'm not going to click there. Um, but on Windows, this is just working fine. So you can use the user's UI here. Um, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to export the configuration, change it, and then import it. All right, let's do config.xml. Let's just go here. All right, let's see configuration file. Let's see, we should find the users here. Um, well, there's the FTP user, there's the backup user. And what I really want to do is just copy this, um, this backup user here. Um, rename it to maybe, I don't know, XCT. And then the path it's exposing, I'm just going to change that to C. And what this is really doing is that now, if we connect with this XCT user and the same password backup has, we should get access to the C drive. Um, we are not an administrator on the server likely because the service is not running a system, but we get in the context of the service user and can then read and write files as the service user. I hope that makes somewhat sense. Um, okay, so I added this here and now we should be able to like import this again. Um, right, let's see, looks, looks good I think. Um, let's just see if it worked. Um, let's do FTP XCT and then where's my notes here? Go to this IP again. Should be the same password. Yes, this worked. And now we're on the C drive. So you can see that this actually worked. And a little trick to see what user 
um, this is running is, is we can basically, um, let's create a temp folder here and just go to the temp folder here. And then let's just put the config here or whatever file, um, doesn't really matter. And now if you go to temp, um, well, let's do all right. Um, yes, and now we check the permissions of the file, we should be able to see who our service user is. And you can see that this user here is the one um, which has full access to it. This basically means that the user that wrote the file is this user here. All right, so by, by doing all of that, um, the whole administration of FileZilla, we essentially got into the service context and now we can write a file in the context of the service user. So um, let's, um, let's see, we are in temp, I guess. Yes, let's go to users, um, ls. And you can see that this user actually exists here. Um, so we can actually go in here now, um, go to desktop, and you can basically read the first flag here. All right, um, what else can we do? Remember that this is SSH and we are, can basically write into the user's folders. So one thing we can do is we can create an SSH directory, um, go there and then put an SSH key, right? So let's exit here. Um, to SSH key gen, um, let's call this SRSRV200. Yes. Let's just copy this to um, authorized keys and then we put this here. All right, now there's an authorized keys file here inside the SSH directory of this user. So I think we should now be able to connect there um, using this key. So let's try it. Like this. Yes, I have to put the port here on my VM. And now we are connected via SSH as this user. And yeah, basically this allowed us to switch context to this service user. Um, let's see if he has like any special permissions. Well, he's not an admin. We can already see that from the prefs here. Um, but he's in the FTP admins group. So maybe he can do something, right? We don't know yet. Okay, so that's the part to the first flag. All right, so how to proceed? We basically got to find out what this user can do, right? Um, let's go back to the E drive. And um, you saw earlier that I believe in public there was a software folder. Um, let's go there. And let's just check the permissions here. And if you go through this, you see that FTP admins has quite a lot of permissions on these folders, um, actually full access to everything. Um, this is something the user we had before didn't have. That's like a big difference. So now we can go to, let's go, um, for example, to key pass. And well, if we repeat the same thing here, we of course also have full access to everything. This means we can write into the key pass folder. And in the next part, you will see what you can do when this is the case. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time.